Hello, everyone. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. So um, welcome to session 12 on inference methods. I'm Janet Kanyarachi, an undergraduate in the Department of Statistics at the University of Jayawadunapur, Sri Lanka. And I will be your chair for the session today. Um, we have an amazing lineup of speakers for you today, sharing the projects on different aspects of statistical inference. And each speaker will be OK, uh, sorry about that. And uh, each speaker will be speaking for 15 minutes. And there'll be three minutes for Q&A, where you can ask questions in the Q&A tab on the right-hand side of your screen. Or you can drop them off at the chat even. At the end of all of the sessions, if there is extra time, we can open the floor uh, for any more questions directed to all uh, of the speakers. And uh, as always, keep in mind that all of these interactions in this session will have to follow the code of conduct for the USAR conference. And the, our first speaker for today is Max Wells. And uh, Max Wells is a PhD candidate in statistics at Economic Institute at the Erasmus University uh, Rotterdam. And he's also affiliated with the Department of Public Health at Erasmus Medical Center. And uh, he will be uh, presenting on the topic of generic machine learning inference on heterogeneous treatment effects using the package generic ML. Uh, Maxwell, you can start sharing your screen now. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Janet. I'll just do that, share a screen. Um, single window. Oops, this is probably not what it's supposed to be. One second, share screen. This should work, great. Can you see, can you see the slides? Yes, I can. Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you so much and uh, for sharing the session, Janet. And also, thank you so much to the audience for being here today. I will present uh, the R package generic ML, which is joint work with Andreas Alfons, Mert de Mira, and Viktor Chernozhukov. As you might have noticed, recent literature on causal inference is focused on heterogeneous treatment effects, in particular, causal machine learning. These methods typically have the goal to provide a means for consistent estimation and uniformly valid inference on conditional average treatment effects. Uniformly valid in, valid in this case means that the inference is valid in a large class of data generating processes. However, without strong assumptions, this is an extremely difficult task, in particular in high dimensions. To remedy this, uh, uh, Chernozhukov, Demir, Duflo, and fernandez Val have recently proposed a method called generic machine learning inference, which is in intended for exactly this type of exactly this type type of situation in a randomized controlled trial setting. Before I can introduce a method, uh, we need some notation. First, let y be the outcome, let z be a vector of covariates, potentially high dimensional, and let d be a binary treatment assignment variable. We assume a random sample of size n, and we assume unconfoundedness, which is a standard assumption in this literature, and random treatment assignment. Moreover, we assume that we can decompose the dependent variable into a part which is affected by the treatment intervention and a part which is not affected by the treatment intervention. More specifically, the part which is not affected by the treatment intervention is called the baseline conditional average and is denoted B0. The part that is affected by treatment uh, intervention is called conditional average treatment effect and is denoted by S0. Typically, literature in causal uh, inference is concerned, at least in modern causal inference, is concerned with consistent estimation of the conditional average treatment effect. However, in generic ML, we deviate from this target. So what we focus on is we focus on estimation on inference on key features of the conditional average treatment effect rather than the effect itself. I will talk, tell you in a moment what key features of the effect mean, but essentially the shift in focus allows us that we do not need to rely on consistent estimation of the conditional average treatment effect, the baseline conditional average. So we, it can be, uh, they, don't even, they don't need to be consistent. Generic ML proceeds in the following three steps. First, we randomly partition the data into two disjoint sets, A and M. On set A, we use some machine learner to obtain estimates for the baseline, co uh, baseline conditional average and the conditional average treatment effect. Then on set M, we calculate key features on the conditional average treatment effect. In this procedure, there are two sources of uncertainty. 
First, there's obviously estimation uncertainty from doing the machine learning estimation in step two. However, this est uh, estimation uh, uncertainty is conditional on the sample split because in the first stage, we have partitioned the sample and having different sample splits may yield very, very different results. And this phenomenon is known in the post-selection inference literature and uh, needs to be addressed. So in this case, we have a second source of uncertainty, which is the splitting uncertainty. We address both sources by repeating steps one to three many times. Concretely, the paper proposes a technique which is called variational estimation and inference, which proceeds as follows. We first fix a significant uh, a significance level. We then calculate the key features across S splits of the data. So we re repeat this procedure S times. And then we take medians across the S splits for each key, uh, of each key feature parameter. Turns out that this method allows inference on each key feature parameter with size control of level two alpha. Moreover, this procedure can be repeated for many different machine learners, and we then would simply report the best one. And best in this case means determined by a certain criterion, which I will discuss if necessary later. Okay, so what did we do? We provide the package generic, generic ML, which implements generic machine learning inference. Generic ML is available on the CRAN, and on GitHub, and we wrote it with the goal in mind to have a flexible, user-friendly, fast, and object-oriented implementation. The entire package is based on the ML3 ecosystem of Lung and colleagues. I would like to show you how generic ML works by means of an empirical example. And concretely, what we will do is we will re re revisit uh, Crepon and colleagues' 2015 study on the effect of microcredits. The authors collect data on 162 villages in rural Morocco and divide them into 81 similar pairs. They then randomly select one village in each pair and make microcredits available for the resident in, residents in that particular village. Then, after some time, they measure if total borrowing has changed. And actually, they measure several outcome variables, but this is the one that we will focus on in this presentation. Overall, the authors collect household level data on 5,500 households and they consist of a dependent variable Y, which is the total volume of borrowing, a treatment indicator D, which takes the value one if the household can access the microcredits, and covariates Z, which can contain 97 variables after encoding, which consist of household level information, among which the variable hat HBL, which is the age of the household's hat. Moreover, we have two grouping variables, demi pairs, pair is a factor of village membership and bill pair is a factor of village pair membership. They will become useful later. Okay, we have provided the data for you and they are currently available in our GitHub repository and so are replication files of these slides and this talk. And if you would like to load the data into your workspace, you can do so like here and we plan on including the entire data set in the future release on the CRAN. Okay, based on results of Capone and colleagues study, find that microcredit availability has only a low take up, 17% in the treatment group, but they still find a significant effect on total borrowing, namely an average treatment effect of about 1200 Moroccan dirham. So the fact that we have a low take up, but still a significant overall effect suggests that there might be treatment effect heterogeneity. And we will use generic ML to investigate that heterogeneity. In order to do that, we need to specify a suite of learners with ML3 syntax. Here, we will use random forests, elastic net, support vector machine, and gradient boosting. In order to do that, we specify a character vector which uses ML3 syntax, like here. So here you can specify the call to, uh, to elastic net, which is in this case uh, in the package GLMnet. And you can also pass uh, arguments or hard parameter choices that you, could, you would uh, like to use here. So in this case, you can use the ML3 syntax, and we also provide some default learners like random forests here. At this point, I should probably mention that throughout the section, throughout this talk, I will use the development version, the current development version of generic ML, because there's a small bug in the print method in the CRAN release, which will be fixed in the, in the upcoming release on the CRAN, but has already been fixed on in the development version. Okay, um, if you remember that, the data, we have spatial data of 81 village pairs. So we would like to include fixed effects for each pair, and we would like to cluster the standard errors on the village level. Generic ML allows this through setup functions, and it, it, ena it enables support for sandwich covariance estimators. Sandwich is a package for covariance matrix estimation. 
Concretely, the function setup x1 customizes the inclusion of controller, controller variables and fixed effects. So in this case, with setup x1, we can specify control variables. We can also specify uh, whether or not fixed effects should be included. And analogously, the function setup vcov customizes covariance estimation. Here we can specify the call to uh, which, um, which uh, uh, sandwich estimator we want to use. And here we can specify the arguments that we would like to pass. In this case, we are going for a cluster robust covariance matrix estimation. All of this in, uh, results in the following generic ML interface. Uh, in generic ML, you need to specify the following arguments, which are uh, the observed data, but also the learners, which we have specified in a character string later and in which we use ML3 syntax. However, there are a couple of, there are quite a bunch of optional arguments as well. So for instance, we have uh, an argument for learner propensity score, which in this case we said equal to constant, which basically just means that they should be, the propensity score should be 0 0.5 for every individual since we are in a randomized experiment. Then we would like to go for 100 sample splits and we would like to evaluate heterogeneity along those five quintiles, which we can specify here as quanta cutoff. We can specify the significance level that we would like to use here. In this case, it's 5%. Here we can specify our setup functions that I've shown earlier. And we can also make uh, some uh, arguments for parallel computing, uh, which we've also done here. However, this is not an exhaustive list of all arguments because we have provided many more arguments for fine tuning of every single step of the generic ML algorithm. For instance, stratified sampling or Harvard's Thompson transformations. I've promised you earlier that I would explain what the key features of the conditional average treatment effects are, effect are. And the way I do this is by showing you the methods for generic ML objects. So if I run the generic ML function, it returns a generic ML object and we have three axes of methods which uh, calculate the key features. The key features are called BLP, gates, and clan, and they are implemented with those get axis of functions. And each axis of function is linked to rich plot and print methods. Starting with the BLP. BLP stands for best linear predictor, and it estimates some coefficients beta one and beta two via ordinary least squares. And beta one turns out by design to be equal to the average treatment effect and beta two is not equal to zero if there is heterogeneity in the conditional average treatment effect and our machine learner predicts that heterogeneity well. So if we like, if we recall this, uh, this uh, get BLP method on our generic ML object, we, uh, we can store it into a BLP info object for which there exists the following print method. So I just call the print method and I get the following out output. So we can see that beta one, which is the average treatment effect, is that it has an estimate of around, around 1100, which is quite close to the baseline results of the paper. It's also significant at one at the one percent level, like in the paper. And we see that beta two has a p-value of about 8.6 percent, which is significant at the 10 percent level. So this already gives some qualitative evidence that there might be, or weak qualitative evidence that, that there might be uh, treatment effect heterogeneity at play. Then there exists a plot method, which returns, in this case, the following plot, which is not terribly useful because of the different scales of the two coefficients. So in this case, I'll just move on to the next print method, uh, to the next uh, method, which is the sorted group average treatment effects implementation, or gates. What you do in gates is you build the following groups uh, according to the magnitude of your machine learning estimation of the conditional average treatment effect. And those groups are governed by intervals i k, which divide the support of the machine learning estimation into upper cap, up in, into capital K regions. And the idea is that if you in, are in group G1, you are in the least affected group. And if you are in group G capital K, you are in the most affected group. It turns out that we can estimate you can estimate the group average uh, treatment effect by, uh, by by means of this by means of a certain coefficient gamma, uh, gamma k, which can be estimated by ordinary least squares. Again, analog analogously to the previous case, there exists um, a method for this case, which is called getGates, and it works on the generic ML object. It also has a print method, which in the interest of time, I will skip, and instead show you the plot method, which returns the following plot. You can see that the least affected group, G1, has a, has a group level estimate of about zero, so there's no uh, treatment effect, but the most affected group has a quite a strong treatment effect of about 2,700 Moroccan dirham. So there's quite some evidence for treatment effect heterogeneity when you when you look at the positive trend across the, across the groups. 
And you can also see here that we have a 90% conference, conference interval for the difference between the most and the least affected group, which only narrowly contains the zero. So this is there seems to be indeed some at least weak evidence for the existence of overall treatment effect heterogeneity. Then there exists the last uh, key feature, which is the classification and analysis called CLAN. CLAN is basically just the observed within group, average, uh, within group averages, delta K, of some variable for uh, each group GK. Again, it works the same way as the previous methods. The only difference is that you need to specify the variable along which you would like to perform the CLAN analysis. Then you get the following uh, print, which is not which I'm also going to skip, and I look at the plot method instead. And if we look at the plot method, I can see that there again seems to be strong heterogeneity along the variable head HBL, which is the household's head, because we can see that uh, the average age in the most affected group is about uh, you know, 23 years, whereas the average age in the least affected group is about 37. And you can also see that difference is statistically uh, significant. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm just going to jump to the conclusions now. We've seen today that uh, high, dimensional high dimensional uniformly valid inference on the conditional average treatment effect is hard, but generic machine learning inference can do so under minimal assumptions by focusing on key features of the effect instead of the effect itself. Today I've presented the R implementation generic ML, which is available on the CRAN. And we, of course, there's uh, room left for future work. And uh, future work could encompass, for instance, to implement monotonization of confidence bounds, which is suggested in the main paper, and to enable support for deep learning, perhaps via ML3 Keras. Okay, that's everything I wanted to say. Thank you so much for your attention. And now I would like to uh, ask if there are questions. And I'm going to unshare my screen. I hope this works because my screen has kind of frozen now. Um, you can still see your screen, Max, but... Um... Yes, because the screen is kind of frozen for me. I can hear you, but I can't see you. Hmm, that's strange. So I will just take questions from now on, and then I will leave and return in a moment, because I'm not sure if I can actually fix this problem. Perhaps I can, but I can't. Yeah. Um, so in the meantime, there is one question on the Q&A panel uh, from mm -hmm. Dennis Shah. Can you comment mm -hmm. on tuning of the ML algorithms that are called... Uh, e.g., how is tuning handled by generic ML? The question again is, can you comment on tuning of the ML algorithms that are being called? Uh, for example, how is tuning handled by generic ML? Okay, so tuning is basically done by the fun uh, done with the packages and functions that ML3 calls. So ML3 is basically a wrapper for existing R. Um, okay. Uh, I believe Maxwell's might have had a small uh, technical difficulty there. Uh, we will wait a few uh, seconds for him to pop back in again. Um, yeah, in the meantime, if you do have any questions, you can uh, put them on the uh, chat window. Um, let's see if he's... Right. Um, I believe it might take some time. So in the interest of time, I will uh, move forward uh, with the next talk. So uh, as our next speaker for today, we have Dr. Guillaume, uh, Dr. Uh, Guillaume Maro. Uh, Dr. Guillaume Maro uh, is uh, an associate professor at Lille University in France. She belongs both to Metrics Research Unit at Faculty of Medicine of Lille an India model team uh, specialized in statistical learning. She will present the work of one of her, uh, her former PhD students uh, about variable selection with multi-layer group lasso. Um, the, uh, so doctor, uh, the, the floor is yours. And also Maxwell, there are some questions on the Q&A tab. Uh, we'll discuss this uh, afterwards, uh, Guillaume Maro's uh, presentation, if that's OK. OK, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can okay, hear you. And, and do you see the presentation? Uh, yeah. I'm sorry? The, the, the screen is shared, or is it OK? Yes, I can see the screen as well. OK, yes. good. So many thanks for this introduction. Indeed, I will present um, a joint work with uh, 
Quentin Grimontré, who is uh, one of my uh, former PhD students, and he was uh, co-supervised co with Alain Celis, who now works uh, at the University of Paris. And this is also a joint work with uh, Samuel Blanc, who is an engineer who helps us maintain the OR package MLGL, because the work presented today uh, is implemented in the OR package MLGL for multi-layer crop lasso. So I will begin with an introduction, and then I will present uh, the methodology. And uh, I will then present an application on a real data set. I won't have time to present simulations, but I will give you uh, some links uh, to see uh, some results. OK, so the development of the package MRGL has been motivated by the context of regression analysis in high dimension, when the number of uh, individuals is much lower than the number of uh, variables p. And in this talk, we will uh, note why uh, the response variable and x, the matrix containing the values of uh, the explanatory variables uh, for the n individuals. And we assume sparsity, that is to say that we assume that uh, k, the number of non-zero elements in the beta uh, vector, uh, k is small. So, uh, we assume uh, that only a few variables uh, uh, have, um, are necessary to explain why. And we want to select these uh, few variables. So we will use uh, penalized regression techniques uh, to deal with high dimensions. So uh, we can uh, minimize our standard criterion. So for example, we can take C of beta, uh, the uh, square mean squares loss, and uh, uh, we will focus in this talk on variable selection and not only predictions, because we really want to select uh, these few variables to ease uh, interpretability in our final model. So maybe this won't be the best predictive model, but we want to really select variables. Uh, as an example, uh, we can look at uh, the lasso, uh, which is well known uh, from Picciarni. And in this example, in the high dimension context, uh, uh, we add a penalty uh, which is based on the L1 norm. And we see that there is a key uh, parameter, a lambda, which is a, a regularization parameter. And uh, depending on the value of lambda, uh, we select more or less variable. For example, uh, if lambda is high, then minus log lambda is small, and you select here only two uh, variables because we have two uh, beta coefficients different from zero. And when you decrease uh, the uh, lambda, then you get more beta coefficients uh, different from zero, and you select more variables. Uh, in fact, when you, ha you have high dimension, you have uh, linear dependence between vectors, and this, the induces problems associated to redundancy, and you also have problems when you have correlations or two correlations cluster. For example, a correlation uh, is responsible for apparent instability uh, when you use uh, lasso uh, classical approaches because you select one uh, variable among the correlated ones, and it can change from one row to another. And in fact, the performance of classical lasso-based approaches strongly deteriorates when uh, the, the number of variables grows for a given number of individuals. And what can be done to solve uh, this uh, problem due to correlation, for example, is to group uh, variables in a preliminary step and then uh, to select groups uh, of correlated variables. This can be done, for example, with group lasso. So this mitigates the instability default. But uh, this usually requires either the knowledge of groups or the calibration of additional parameters uh, if you use other techniques. So the objective of multilayer group lasso is to select groups of correlated variables in high dimension without knowing groups a priori and without adding too many parameters to tune. So the multi-layer uh, multi group lasso uh, procedure is based uh, 
both on a hierarchical cluster analysis and group lasso. So first, we build a hierarchy uh, with bootstrap, uh, and then we compute uh, the path of groups selected by group lasso with respect to uh, uh, given regularization parameters. Um, and we perform hierarchical multiple testing to remove false positive for each given lambda. And then we tune lambda uh, to select the final groups of influential variables. In fact, the main originality of multi year group lasso is uh, to be able to choose groups from different levels of HCA. In fact, there were many methods in the literature uh, uh, proposed to, uh, to perform both uh, hierarchical cluster analysis and uh, Lasso, but most of them uh, rely on only one level of uh, the hierarchical cluster analysis. And the flexibility of multi layer group lasso is really to choose groups from different levels of HCA. Of course, this flexibility uh, induces a complexity which is high. Uh, that's why we exploit the hierarchical structure of the HC uh, of the hierarchical cluster analysis and the weight in group lasso to reduce this complexity. So given G star, the union of all the partitions uh, at the different levels of the hierarchy, uh, we then define the design matrix and the estimator. So we note G S, uh, the partition of a given level in S group. And so the MSGL estimator is simply a novel lapping group lasso uh, estimator, but we, uh, with a classical group uh, W, uh, no, the classical weight for groups uh, W, G, S that we can define, for example, uh, with uh, the square root of the cardinal of uh, the group, uh, which is commonly used. And then uh, the, the key weight uh, that we exploit in MSGS is the weight uh, uh, associated to the quality of partition. So in fact, we have all the possible partitions, but uh, we choose weights for the quality of partitions given the highest jump rule. Uh, the idea is that when the jump is high, then we want to cut the dendrogram at this step. So we want to favor uh, the, the, the level uh, where we uh, would naively cut. But still, I insist on that uh, point, in MLGL, even if the a priori weight uh, gives more uh, chance to groups uh, uh, who correspond to a partition uh, with the highest jump rule, uh, this is flexible and we can uh, select groups from different levels. Um, then we reformulate the problem uh, such that a given group only appears once by keeping the smallest weight uh, to reduce the complexity. And we show in a lamb that anyway it would be that one uh, which would be selected. And then we use classical algorithms of group lasso, for example, the one implemented in G lasso. Then uh, we have too many, um, too many groups uh, in the past. Uh, so for each given lambda, uh, we will uh, provide a multiple testing procedure to control both multiple testing and redundancy. And this multiple testing uh, includes a hierarchical test uh, procedure. And uh, once we have uh, uh, removed uh, the false positives uh, for each given lambda, then we choose the uh, final regularization parameter, lambda, which maximizes the number of rejections. I will now show uh, an example uh, on uh, the gasoline data set, which is included in the our package PLS. So this data set uh, consists uh, of near infrared spectra, uh, and we have measures uh, on 60 uh, samples and uh, observations and 401 wavelengths. And we want to look for wavelengths which enable to predict octane number. 
so to run MLGL, uh, the main function is the function full uh, process. And in fact, uh, to avoid overfitting, we need uh, to uh, divide uh, the initial samples in two parts, uh, one for the uh, group lasso uh, part and one for uh, the multiple testing part. That is why there is the argument fraction sample MLVL to say, okay, we, we uh, separate it in two parts. And uh, we also don't want to have uh, groups uh, with uh, too many variables. So uh, we uh, first uh, put an option to, to, to give a maximum size at uh, 100, which was a number which was in the initial paper of the Gezeline data set. And uh, also, uh, to, uh, to avoid um, uh, the influence of the splitting in two parts, uh, we want the distance matrix of the, uh, to, uh, to be in input of the hierarchical cluster uh, to be uh, uh, in uh, not too, too much influence. So we bootstrap the distance matrix. And then we have the summary and plot which gives the main results and useful graph. Uh, then we compare uh, with lasso and group lasso the MLGL method. So um, on this data set, we see that uh, the group lasso, so to apply this group lasso method, we uh, just uh, select the uh, level, the partition, uh, which correspond to the highest jump rule, which would be uh, the naive approach uh, when performing uh, uh, hierarchical clustering. And then we apply group lasso with the known groups of this partition. And in fact, here we see that it selects too many uh, variables. Um, and then uh, we see uh, that uh, the lasso selects only 14 uh, variables, but they are decorated. And in fact, the interest of MLGL is to see that uh, gives, okay, there are many questions, so I, I will quit, or maybe not. I will just conclude. MLG selects groups of correlated variables in high dimension by combining hierarchical clustering and group lasso. And it allows different levels of the hierarchy to be selected. Uh, the optimal value of regularization is chosen with a hierarchical multiple testing procedure, which gives a low number of rejection. Uh, in fact, we one can uh, look for perspectives to improve this step, but still the first step without the multiple testing is interesting. And this package is available on CRAN and its vignette uh, is in post-processing stage for publication in a journal of statistical software. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Guillermo Moro, uh, for the wonderful talk. Uh, the using of hierarchical cluster analysis for defining the different groups was really intriguing about the talk. Um, if there are any questions uh, for, for Dr. Guillermo Moro, you can uh, put those questions in the Q&A tab or put them up on the chat panel. Um, so uh, if there are any questions, let's wait a few minutes. Um, Right. Uh, while the audience is writing down their questions, uh, so I have one question uh, about uh, this, uh, the slides that were used. So I was quite interested about the hierarchical cluster analysis uh, step. And uh, in slide nine, you mentioned uh, of using uh, the highest leap size. So what would exactly happen if you did not use a maximum size for these uh, groups? Yeah. Um... Well, if we, if we don't give the maximum size, then it tends to select the uh, very big groups uh, as GoPlasso uh, did uh, on these data sets. Uh, because the highest jump uh, on these data sets uh, is clearly uh, uh, with uh, a small number of groups, with very big groups. And the advantage of uh, having this uh, parameter uh, to say, OK, we don't want too many groups, it, uh, it, it, it will go to levels which are uh, lower in the hierarchy, and then uh, it gives a better, uh, better groups. Uh, 
you'll see that it doesn't say too many sizes. Mm. Right, right. Uh, thank you so much for that. So, um, were there any differences between the penalization techniques that uh, you used uh, within the study in the group lesson? Uh, sorry, I, I, I see the one uh, question I, I didn't hear. I looked at the yes. ah, okay. Uh, no <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, this question is from uh, Dr. Emerick Stam uh, himself. So, uh, can you comment on the robustness of the choice of linkage criterion? Yeah, this is a good question. <laughs> um, in fact, so on the application of the Gezeline data set, uh, we tested, of course, uh, different uh, linkage criterion. And we, uh, what I would advise is to, uh, to, to choose average uh, linkage criterion because uh, uh, the, the jumps are not very different in uh, the size. And so the, the weights are not very different. When we took the, the word, criterion, uh, which is uh, commonly used, then uh, uh, we had a tendency to uh, to do as a naive method, uh, which is, uh, okay, you select uh, the highest jump. And in fact, uh, when you perform just a uh, hierarchical clustering analysis and then group lasso, it gives the same results as MRGL because the weights uh, are two different from the different levels of the hierarchy. So the flexibility offered by MRGL is not uh, that nice. All right. Uh, so um, with that, uh, I believe we can wrap up uh, Dr. Game Maro's uh, talk on the variable selection with multi-layer group lasso. Thank you so much uh, for uh, organizing this talk. So uh, next up, our the ne uh, next speaker for this session would be Dr. John Ferguson. Uh, Dr. John Ferguson attended his PhD in statistics at UL University in 2009. After his PhD, he worked at George Washington University and University of Limerick before taking up his current role at NUI Galway uh, in 2015. He is also the current holder of an Emerging Investigator Award for work on causal inference in population health. Today, he will be giving his talk on the topic of causal analysis in R using Bayesian network models to predict the impact of public health interventions on disease prevalence in population health with population attributable fractions. So uh, Dr. John, uh, this, the floor is yours. You can start sharing your screen. Uh, thanks, Janet. I've simplified the, ta uh, the title a bit. I mean, that was very complicated. So um, yeah. uh, so it'll be a bit easier. Um, so, OK. Do people see this? Uh, I can't actually see the anyone's faces. So do people see my presentation? Uh, yes, we can see it. Uh, I believe everyone else can see it as well. Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, thanks for the introduction again. Um, so this is a joint work uh, with Morris O'Connell. Both of us are from NUI Galway. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, a package graph path uh, to, to calculate population attributable fractions in R. Uh, so just a very quick introduction. So uh, population attributable fractions are measures of disease burden. So they're uh, the fraction of uh, maybe stroke cases or heart disease that might be prevented if a particular risk factor could be removed from the population. So uh, you could ask, in, for instance, in Ireland, if nobody smoked, what would be the percentage reduction in heart disease? And from this, you can sort of see clearly that this might depend on the population. So perhaps more people smoke in China, the attributable fraction for smoking may be actually higher in China. Uh, so this is uh, epidemiologists are very interested in this just to, to understand the drivers of disease and uh, also to, I suppose, design health interventions on particular risk factors uh, to prevent disease. So you see these uh, calculations quite a lot in the media. So, so here, this is 90% of strokes could be avoided. I think this is if 10 risk factors could be removed from the population. Uh, we're going to actually be um, using a data set simulated from this study later. Um, here, this is a probably a misinterpretation. Attributable fractions are generally uh, disease cases avoided if a risk factor could be removed. 
but that's actually not quite the same as being caused by the risk factor. It's a subtle difference. So uh, the media kind of sometimes misinterprets things. And this is a sort of a different sort of attributable fraction kind of looking into f the future. So it's saying half a million Alzheimer's disease cases in the UK are expected in the next decade. A uh, healthy lifestyle might prevent half of them. So from, from this, you can see that the target of the estimation can depend a little on the study design. So there are three big designs in epidemiology. They're cross-sectional, case control, and longitudinal cohort. So the cross-sectional and case control designs, uh, you're generally estimating kind of the proportion of current disease prevalence that might be avoided without the risk factor in those designs. Whereas for uh, cohort studies, uh, you generally follow a group of people who don't have disease over time, and you see what proportion of those people at time T have the disease. And then you estimate, well, if there was no risk factor in the population, what would be the proportion you would have disease at time T? So it's a proportion of avoided uh, disease uh, in a particular time period. And um, it's uh, actually a fraction, it's actually a function of time. So as I said, we're going to talk about uh, graph path today, but there's actually lots of R packages uh, for PAF estimation uh, already. So um so what the these kind of you know they're coming uh, back back uh you know from 2010 until until now and uh you know they basically depend on the sort of study design um you know so some methods are just for cohort design some methods are for uh cross-sectional and so on um so so like why would we create um graph path well it's convenient to have uh, all the tools uh, in one place. So I suppose consolidation, uh, but also uh, we've developed a number of um, uh, kind of uh, sort of new applications, I suppose, of attributable fractions for new situations in the past few years in our group. And actually uh, it just makes sense to kind of develop an R package that's uh, sort of can actually encompass all of these things. So some of these things are PAF nomograms. Uh, so you can think of these as sort of just graphs that display disease burden for several risk factors uh, together. So PAF for continuous exposures. So things like air pollution or um, blood pressure measured continuously, versions of PAF for that. Uh, PAF corresponding to a particular pathway by which disease occurs. So like how much disease burden is caused by a particular, not by a particular risk, risk factor, but by the mechanism, by a uh, one of the mechanisms by which a particular risk factor works. So we actually call this pathway specific PAF or PSPAF. Uh, so PAF for joint interventions on a number of risk factors together and calculations of average and sequential PAF and average path-specific PAF. So these are really calculations where uh, the individual measures of disease burden sum up to the joint PAF. So it's a kind of partition. Uh, today, I don't really have time to talk about all of this today. I'm gonna just focus on the PAF for uh, joint interventions. Um, so, uh, uh, so, uh, so the PAF for a, a joint PAF is the disease burden that could be appropriated for a collection of risk factors. So the interstroke study that we kind of uh, just briefly referred to as an example. So it estimated that 90% of incident strokes might have been avoided if 10 major risk factors could be removed from the population. Um, so we're going to demonstrate the use of graph path in estimating the joint PAF for two of these 10 risk factors, smoking and diabetes. And I'm going to use simulated stroke data. Uh, it's the data set stroke reduced that's uh, contained in the graph path uh, package. Uh, so, so that's just going to be the test case. So uh, just a little bit of causal inference. So probably a lot of people know this already. But, um, 
you know, so estimating attributable fractions is actually tricky. So what you're actually asking is like, what would the d disease be, uh, risk be in the population if nobody smoked? And uh, you can't do something so simplistic as compare disease risk in smokers and non-smokers. Uh, so, you know, smokers might differ from non-smokers in multiple ways that actually affect their disease risk, uh, apart from them just being smokers. So, you know, it's not necessarily true that if there's a difference in disease risk, it's smoking is the, cause, the, the, the reason for, for the cause of that. So you would say in causal uh, inference parlance that they're sort of non-exchangeable groups. So a standard approach uh, to, to kind of uh, correct for this is to adjust for uh, confounders, which are sort of the joint causes of the risk factor and disease. And, uh, you know, you have an average to sub subsequent disease risk. And that would be an estimate of the, I suppose, the probability of disease in a population where nobody smoked, basically. You're sort of averaging uh, predicted these disease risk if no one's if people didn't smoke and uh, the natural values of confounder in the po in the population stays uh, over the population. But uh, the the problem is uh, for uh, particular causal structures, uh, it's not so simple to just adjust for confounders uh, in the case of uh, a joint attributable fraction. So. Um, you know, in our test case here, we're interested in the attributable fraction for smoking and type 2 diabetes. And if you see this causal graph, um, you can see, for instance, the um, variables that are in the lifestyle group. Uh, there's a narrow going into the physiology group. So that's actually corresponding to a direct causal effect. So variables in lifestyle may affect variables like blood pressure in physiology. Um, so what you can actually see from this is that, for instance, blood pressure. Blood pressure is a confounder for, for diabetes. So blood pressure may be a cause of diabetes and a cause of stroke. So it's something that you would have to adjust for uh, to, to estimate a causal effect of diabetes. But then blood pressure is actually an effect of smoking. So if you're estimating the causal effect of smoking on stroke, you don't want to adjust for blood pressure. You would be sort of sort of adjusting out effect, uh, some of the effect of smoking. It's not that simple, but you shouldn't do this. It's a sort of mediator. It's blood pressure is on the causal pathway between smoking and stroke. So this raises a question of, you know, what you do if you want to, I suppose, adjust uh, or correct, you're estimating the joint PAF for smoking and type 2 diabetes. How do you adjust for confounding? And you can't really do it very easily from a single regression model. So the solution that we've actually sort of come up with here is to sort of use Bayesian networks. Um, so uh, the simplest way to explain this, I suppose, is so if we do really believe this causal graph, if it's a real causal uh, DAG, then the joint probability distribution of all the variables should be, uh, you should be able to factorize this uh, in terms of a product of the conditional distributions of each node conditions on the parents node, parents nodes. So those are the direct causes. So for instance, the conditional distribution for smoking here, based on our assumptions, probably not in reality, would be uh, conditioned on education, country, age, and gender. So Pearl uh, popularized this approach, basically. And then you know, the idea is to consider a do operator. What would happen to the causal graph under an intervention that kind of eliminated smoking from the population? So you can think of this as, well, if you're eliminating smoking from the population, you kind of eliminate the direct causes of smoking. So you got the arrows going into smoking get removed. And then to simulate data from that um, intervention distribution, what you can do is you can, first of all, fit probability models for each uh, node or each variable, uh, which are just functions or the probability models are uh, the covariates are just the parents of the particular node. 
And then you simulate uh, data from the resulting basically intervention distribution given uh, smoking equals zero or smoking equals zero is assuming you've removed smoking. So this can be done recursively. So you would simulate uh, the re physiology variables from, uh, you know, uh, assuming smoking equals zero, then you would s simulate the diabetes and sort of the other kind of preclinical disease variables and so on. Um, I should say that this, this graph is sort of an abridged causal graph. I've kind of stripped out some of the variables. Um, but anyway, you simulate basically a data set, uh, assuming, you know, basically assuming there was no uh, smoking in the population. And then you can actually uh, look at the second do operator, which kind of takes the data set, assuming smoking has been limited, uh, eliminated, which you've simulated, and it effectively removes the arrows that are pointing into diabetes. And to do this, you only actually simulate now the descendants of diabetes, uh, which Actually, it's uh, the only descendant of diabetes is actually stroke. Um, but this approach can be used in more generality. I mean, if you had an arbitrarily complicated causal graph and a joint intervention on lots of variables, and the intervention doesn't have to be to remove the risk factors completely. Um, but anyway, it's a quite a general approach, assuming you know the graph. So then the estimator for joint PAF, uh, you know, it simply compares the, the sort of uh, average disease burden or the disease burden in the population to the predicted disease burden uh, simulated in your simulated data set, basically. Um, so this is because the, uh, it's actually a randomized estimator, you know, because, you know, the DS if you kind of do this process over and over, you'll get different estimates each time, but you can actually average this over several different random data sets. And then it's quite, it could be quite slow, but you know, the, we've actually sort of used bootstrap inference, um, you know, uh, implemented using the R library boot. So to actually do this, well, you'll have to sort of install GraphPath uh, from uh, my GitHub repository. And then the next thing you do is you specify the causal graph. So this constitutes, first of all, the risk factors that can be modified by intervention. So those are actually in this vector node vec. Um, and then also the uh, for each of those risk factors, you have to specify their parents in the, ca in the causal graph. Um, so, so those are all basically each risk factor, you get a vector of parents, you know, uh, which are the, you know, the direct causes of that risk factor. And then you put the parents into a sort of a list. So next you actually have to sort of fit models. So, um, so like graph path, because it's actually simulation based, it's only kind of, it's assuming either a continuous uh, response to sort of a, a linear model, a sort of, binary logistic model or an ordinal response if you have a multi-category risk factor. So um, you can actually, you know, so you can specify the models individually if, they, if there are lots of interactions and so on, but there's also kind of an automatic fit function that will recognize the variable types uh, and it will just fit additive models. It will allow you to fit sort of nonlinear effects for continuous variables uh, and, you know, perhaps interactions uh, between confounders if they're kind of, if you think that those are sort of uh, like sort of, um, you know, kind of involved in all of the causal models. But uh, if you want to sort of, you, if you want, you can just specify the models individually yourself. This is just something to help if you have a very large causal graph. So then um, applying the model, uh, applying the kind of a joint PAF estimator, you use this joint PAF function. Um, you have to specify the kind of variables that are subject to intervention. So that's in the VARS or VARS arguments. You can see smoking and diabetes. And you, you obviously give the, this joint PAF function as arguments, the model list and uh, the list of parents for each node and uh, the node of uh, the, the node vec, which is the vector of risk factors. Um, and so this actually took about seven minutes on my laptop along with the bootstrap. This was averaging over a hundred 
uh, sort of repetitions of that randomized estimator that you actually, um, you know, that I actually saw, uh, kind of showed. So, so this um, shows uh, as an estimate in a population, well, it's really a global estimate. So globally, if there were, and that shouldn't be no strokes, that should be no smoking and no diabetes, the rate of strokes would be around 16% lower. And there's a confidence interval. So you can actually also use those functions in graph path for in, you know, estimating PF for a single risk factor, but you can use joint path to do that as well. It's not the best idea because it's simulation based and it's a bit slow and you don't have this problem of uh, sort of recanting a witness or risk factors acting as confounding, uh, confounders of each other if you just have a single risk factor. Um, but um, the interesting thing is that the PF for smoking is 11.6%, estimated 11.6%. Uh, the PF for diabetes is 5.4%. So they add up to 17%, but you it's, it's bigger than the 16%, but you kind of expect that because uh, the strokes that might be prevented by, uh, not, not by the population eliminating smoking and kind of population with no diabetes, those, those might, some of those will overlap basically. So I suppose disease can be prevented in multiple ways sometimes. So just as a conclusion, um, so Hernan and Robbins have said uh, causal modeling obviously requires heroic assumptions. So very difficult really to specify causal graphs. And uh, so this actually assumes you can specify the causal graph and also the causal models are correctly specified. So these are just caveats. Um, I think one thing is that special care needs to be taken with case control data sets when risk factors are recorded after disease diagnosis. So you, can, you could actually get some sort of reverse causation that people change their behavior after they're diagnosed with a disease. Uh, so graph path is downloadable and the GitHub, in my GitHub repository, we will upload it to CRAN eventually. It's still in development and there is a tutorial paper that we will release. And obviously I'd be very happy to get any feedback and uh, yeah, okay, that's that's all. I think I uh, have some references there, and uh, I'll try to uh, kind of unshare my screen. <laughs> well, um, thank you so much, Doctor John. Uh, that was a fantastic talk. I actually had the thought of using Bayesian methods for causal analysis, and this opened my eye a lot on that field, and uh, so. If you have any questions for uh, Dr. John, you can uh, post those questions here uh, on the chat or on the Q&A tab. Um, meanwhile, I do have a question of my own. So do you have any plans of uh, integrating the B, uh, the objects from B and learn package for the uh, graph PAF package? Um, so, I mean, that was one thing that we've done. Uh, I've worked or, you know, experimented a lot to sort of uh, I suppose, uh, causal structure learning. So perhaps, I mean, this is really for a sort of a network that you kind of pre-specify. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I think in epidemiology, it's difficult to, you know, like uh, to kind of learn these networks. I think a lot of, I mean, that's my own opinion that a lot of the network structure might be known already, or it's just, you know, for if you talk to a clinician, you know, they kind of have a very good idea of the broad sort of pattern in which things develop. And, you know, so, so but it would be good. I mean, I suppose it could definitely be done. And, you know, if, if you want to sort of get some help in specifying your network, I suppose. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I also believe that uh, you could also provide some more visualization uh, techniques to see how the graph is as well. Well, that that's true. Yeah, that that's true. Yeah. That borrow some of their uh, plotting facilities and so on. Mm. Yes. Uh, all right then. So uh, we have come to the last talk of the session, and the last speaker of our session is Dr. Imerick Stam. Uh, Dr. Imerick Stam works as a research engineer in statistics at the National Center of Scientific Research in France. He's also a research fellow at the Computational Radiology Laboratory affiliated to the Department of Radiology of Boston Children's Hospital 
and Harvard Medical School in USA. So, uh, Dr. Emmerich, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. <clears throat> Can you hear me well? Yes, yes, loud and clear. Okay, so, and can you see the presentation as well? Yes, you can. <clears throat> okay, so um, today I'm gonna to talk about um, Flipper, which is basically uh, doing permutation testing and more generally permutation inference um, for any type of data structure, any, any complex data you might have. And um, so this is a joint work with Alessia Pini and Simone Vantini from, uh, from Politecnico di Milano. And um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit first about uh, the history uh, of uh, why uh, Flipper was born. So I think like everybody else, uh, I started experimenting on permutation testing and permutation inference using simple data, meaning scalar valued data. Um, so I, sh I shall precise here that I'm gonna do all, I'm gonna focus here on the two sample testing problem. So the thing that we have two sample and we want to say something about whether these samples have been generating from the same distribution or not. So uh, uh, we can use permutation testing. And so I tried that some time ago using scalar valued data also to, to understand how permutations work. And I developed some code to do the permutation machinery to enable uh, computing a p-value using permutation theory. And then, um, I moved to vector valued data. So because I wanted to, so I had a vector of features because I was working with high dimensional data. I developed a, a hoteling version for high dimensional and uh, we were stuck here and we, we thought maybe permutation uh, theory can help us doing uh, the testing procedure. And so we developed again, some similar code to do the permutation machinery. And then my colleagues at Polytechnico, they're expert of functional data. They said, we should use the permutation theory to uh, come up with testing procedures for functional data where the samples now are not uh, scalars or vectors, but they're actually functions living in infinite dimensional spaces. And um, so we had to develop some other codes, including the permutation machinery to make it work with functional data. Then I had the opportunity to co-supervise a PhD student who worked on inference for network valued data. So now we have samples of networks and we want to say something about the, the the model that generated these samples, whether it's similar or not. And now when I arrived in France, my colleagues said, oh, we're gonna work on topological data analysis. So these are again, new data structures and we want to be able to do the same thing. And I said, stop, I, I don't want to repeat coding again and again and again, permutation machinery. So I came up with Flipper. So Flipper, I, I thought is gonna be the low level package that implements the permutation machinery once and for all. And then it's going to be a dependency on, of these independent packages. And now these packages are not all of them on CRAN, but uh, FDA test and Nevada are on CRAN and the other ones maybe will reach CRAN one day. I don't know yet. Uh, but um, the idea is that is to have Flipper handle the permutation machinery and then the child packages handle the different data, data structures. So it's, it's really kind of an ecosystem. But Flipper actually has one main thing, one beast, which is the plausibility function. What's the plausibility function? It's quite simple. When you want to perform an null hypothesis is because you have a, in mind a value maybe for the parameters and uh, under investigation. So if we think about the difference between the mean of two population, the parameter of interest is the difference between the mean that we often call delta. And so uh, we might have an intuition on the parameter delta and we want to understand whether this hypothetical value is plausible given the data that we have. So that's achieve, we can achieve, we can achieve a measure of the plausibility of that value using the p-value of the test. Often we, we assume that delta in the null hypothesis is zero and we want to test whether there is an effect, for example. So that essentially in, in terms of plausibility function means is uh, the difference between the mean equal to zero a plausible value given the data that I observed. And we can make the value under the null hypothesis of delta vary. And so we can explore the whole parameter space. So we can say maybe 
okay, I want to test whether there is a difference or not, but I can also test whether the difference is three or two, and I can explore all that space, and for each value, I can ask myself whether this value, specific value, is plausible given the data that I got. So basically, I can end up with uh, what some people call a p-value function, but I like the, the term plausibility function better, because p-value function is used also in other contexts. And so essentially, for each value under the null hypothesis, you can have a, an associated p-value. And if we focus here uh, on, 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 the, on, the, on the blue curve here, we can see that we have a number of details that can help making inference, and I will um, go over them uh, later on. So this is, uh, the example is for two normal distributions. We're comparing two normal distributions, so actually the plausibility function in that case is closed formed. But here I use Flipper for demonstration that we can also approximate it using permutation theory. In terms of implementation, um, the uh, plausibility function in Flipper is an R6 class, so it's object-oriented. And so you have to instantiate this uh, plausibility function. And basically, the ingredients that you need are at least four. You need uh, what I call the null specification function, because uh, for those of you who know about permutation testing, uh, the, the, the idea is to approximate the distribution of the test statistics under the null hypothesis by assuming that under the null hypothesis, the two samples are exchangeable. But still, you have to tell Flipper when, once you choose what you put in, in the null hypothesis, you have to tell Flipper how to transform sample two to make it exchangeable with sample one under H0. So you need to provide that function. Then you need also to provide a list of test statistics that are going to be used. Uh, most of the time, we focus on inference on one parameter, but we're going to see later that we can do more. And so most of the time, we're going to use one test statistics. And in the case of difference between the means, it's often the student statistic. And then you provide us also a list of index assignments, because you need to tell um, for each inferred parameter um, the test statistics that are sensitive to it. So this, that's going to become uh, hopefully clearer with the example later. And of course, you need to provide the data, so the two lists of samples. And it's important that these be two lists. And, I mean, there is a fifth, but it's, uh, so Flipper does it if you forget it, but you need to specify a seed. This is because we're doing permutation theory, and when you compute the plausibility function, you need to make sure to use the same permutations uh, for each time you change the value into the null hypothesis in order to have the smooth plausibility function. And the p-value the p is then computed using permutation theory. So in terms of code, this is uh, what uh, you can do. So the first um, lines of code here is just to generate two samples of normal for coming from a normal distributions with different means, same standard deviation. So the null specification here uh, is a function with two arguments. The first is the list containing the objects of the second sample. And the second is a vector of parameters, which are the parameters of interest on which you want to make inference. So in the present situation, that's going to be to fix the ideas, the difference between the means mu y minus mu x. So that we're going to call delta. So you need to say for each element of the list y, how do I modify it in order to make the y sample exchangeable with the x sample? And so here it's easy. You just have to subtract delta. So the mean in the y sample becomes the mean of the x sample and you can exchange them. Then you need to specify the list of test statistics. So here, since we are focusing on the difference between the means, we are going to use this uh, stat t function, which is essentially what this is uh, statistics functions in Flipper, which replicates student statistics in a Flipper compatible way. And then we, we need to uh, define a list of stat assignments basically saying um, which test statistics are sensitive to delta. Here we only have one parameter, which is delta. We only have one st uh, test statistics. So delta equal one, meaning delta, uh, the, the statistics that is sensitive to delta is the first of the list, the stat functions list. And once we have these ingredients, we can instantiate the plausibility function using plausibility function dollar new and putting inside all the things that we just defined. 
So that's uh, an empty thing now. So we have instantiated this plausibility function and it's kind of empty, but you have a first important method from this class that you can use to perform any kind of hypothesis testing you want. Say you want to test whether delta is 2.8 or not. You just have to call the method getValue with 2.8 and um, it uh, reports the, the associated p-value. Um, if you want to test a hypothesis like this one, delta uh, greater or equal to 2.8, uh, then you have to set the alternative hypothesis. You have to say that it's a left tail test. And then you can again call get value and it updates the p-value, taking into account the fact that you told him it's a left tail test. We can try also with uh, uh, delta equal, equal to three. Why did I choose this? Uh, because the true mean difference is three. But what you can see here is that the p-value associated to delta equal three is not one, is not uh, the maximum, meaning that it's not, not, it's not necessarily the true mean that actually maximizes the plausibility function. And for those of you who know about permutation inference from permutation testing, uh, the p-value calculated from permutations depends, the, its resolution depends on the number of permutations you do. So in Flipper, the default, when you instantiate the plausibility function is 1000 permutation, but you can modify this by using the set n perms method. And uh, so if we, if we switch to 10,000, for example, you see a small improvement of the resolution here. So that's one thing. You can do hypothesis testing. And so once you have the plausibility function, you have access, so you can use uh, any H0 you want. But you also can do point estimation because if you think about it, since we have the plausibility function, meaning that for any value of the parameter of interest, I know how plausible it is given the data, I can say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna compute an estimate, a point estimate of my parameter by saying the point estimate is gonna be that parameter that is the most plausible given my data. So I'm gonna maximize the plausibility function essentially uh, solving the equation plausibility function equal to one. So before showing the methods that do that does that, um, here I switch to 100 permutations for to, to compile the slides faster. Um, there is an attribute in the, in the class, uh, plausibility function class called parameters that stores an up-to-date version of your parameters of interest. It stores three things, three things for each parameter, the name, the range, and the point estimate. So you can see here that it recorded that we have one parameter of interest, which is delta. The range is unknown. The point estimate is still unknown. So now we can call the method set point estimate, and it's going to maximize the plausibility functions. Of course, if you have an initial guess of the, of the value of the parameter that might maximize it, it's good to, uh, to tell it because it's going to make the optimization faster. And then you can see that the, 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 the attribute, the parameters attributes has been updated and the point estimate value for delta is now known. It's 3.13. And you, we can go further with the plausibility function. We can also have almost for free confidence intervals as well. We fix a confidence level. So we have a significance level alpha and we just have to solve the equation plausibility function equal alpha to find the, uh, uh, the confidence in interval. So there is a method that does that in the plausibility function class called set parameter bounds. You uh, give us input the point estimate that you computed before and a confidence level. And then it's gonna solve this equation and updates the parameters uh, attribute. So now we also have a range. So confidence intervals are useful. Uh, are useful. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't have to convince anyone, but you can also use, now that you have a range for each parameters, so here just one parameter, you can compute a grid of parameters using the, the set grid methods. Uh, you give the number of points, you, get, you give the, the updated parameters, and then you can call the plausibility, the get value method or niche of the rows of this table with the method evaluate grid, which is parallelized, by the way. And then you have a nice grid, uh, which is a table that you can use with ggplot, for example, or anything else to uh, 
to visualize your plausibility function if you want. But we can go further with uh, permutations, and that's the nice thing. There is something called uh, non-parametric combination that allows you to actually make inference for several parameters simultaneously. So if you think at comparing two normal distributions, it's actually trickier than what we did so far, because uh, they usually vary both in means and in variance. So usually what you can say about two normal distributions is that one, y, for example, is equal to delta plus rho x. And so what you want to do really is inference on both delta and rho. And so we can solve this, this equation that I'm showing here to see that there is a relationship between delta rho and the mean and variance of the two, the two distributions. So how would we do that with Flipper? So we, we, first of all, we generate some data with mean and standard deviation differences. And then the null specification function, remember, is supposed to say how I transform each object in Y using my parameters to make it exchangeable with X under the null hypothesis. Well, since, X, since Y, sorry, is equal to delta plus rho X, what I need to do is take every object in Y, subtract delta, divide by rho, and then I have something that has the same distribution as uh, X. So good. So here now I have two parameters. So my parameters here is, is a vector of length two. First we have delta and second, uh, and second index is rho. So next I have to define uh, test statistics. And here I, I need to define at least two test statistics because I need one test statistic that is going to be sensitive to the difference between the mean and one that is going to be sensitive to differences in variance. So I use stat D as before for student statistic and stat F for Fisher statistic. And my list of assignments is to say uh, stat T is the statistic that is sensitive to delta and stat F is the one sensitive to rho. And by the way, the assignment list also inform Flipper, the plausibility function of the names of the parameters. And then I can instantiate plausibility function as usual and call exactly everything, all the methods we called before, set point estimates to update the parameter attributes to have point estimate of the two parameters, set parameter bounds to find confidence intervals first of the two parameters, and then set grid. So I, I'm going to have one more column here on my grid because I have two parameters and evaluate grid. Of course, it's going to take longer. But in the end, we can end up with something like that, which is simultaneous inference for both delta and rho. And you can read here with the most external ring, the 5% the, the confidence region for both parameters. So this means that Flipper, hopefully, and this is what we believe, is completely agnostic to the type of data that you put in. And this is done how? Because in, you need to inform Flipper about the data but simply providing two lists. So a two list, and Flipper doesn't really care what's, what kind of object is within the list. Why is that? Because it's the user that needs to specify the test statistic that uh, he or she wants to use. Uh, meaning that uh, the user has to know how the list of objects is structured because the test statistic will use that, but Flipper will not. Flipper, Flipper will simply use the test statistic and apply it to permuted version of the data without really caring about what are the objects in the lists of data. So obviously, the, uh, and I mentioned that before, the test statistic needs to be written in a form uh, that is compatible with Flipper. So there is a use stat function in Flipper that is a helper function that, pro that um, helps you start with a template for the statistic to be compatible with Flipper, which basically takes two arguments, data and indices one, because this is, you need to provide the indices of the first sample in, you need to think that you are within the permutation scheme and at some point you have indices of uh, samples that belong to the, to the first permuted sample. And then you have the data, which is the concatenated list of all data. And so, so you have to start with that. And, um, and, and then you have to code your own test function, uh, test statistics, sorry. And great use case of this is the Nevada package, uh, 
which I invite you, if you're interested, to, to look at. This is for inference for a population of networks. So we have lists of networks, high graph networks. And so uh, we design specific test statistics to work with Flipper. Uh, with that, I thank you for your attention. And I'm, uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Eric. Um, I believe we have run uh, past the uh, scheduled session time. So if you have any questions, please do uh, put them in the chat or in the Q&A session as soon as possible. Uh, meanwhile, uh, thank you so much to all the presenters, uh, Maxwell, Dr. John Ferguson, Dr. Gimmy Murrow, Dr. Imer Stem for taking your time to make these amazing talks. Um, if you have more questions to our speakers, you can reach out to them throughout the, through the event platform itself. And also a huge thank you uh, to our sponsors of the USR conference as well. Um, so with that, uh, since there aren't any questions, I believe, uh, for on the chat on the Q&A, if there are any questions, if someone wants to ask any questions, they can reach out to the event platform, as I mentioned earlier. So with that, I believe we can wrap up this session. So thank you, everyone, and hope you have a good... Oh, there is one question. Uh, could you comment on one, how sensitive the optimization of theta zero and its confidence interval computation are towards the number of permutations used, and two, how to use the, uh, how to choose the number of permutations if you are applying this method in multiple testing settings. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, so the so it's um, it's related to the resolution of the PN. So uh, of course, if we are far, if theta zero is far from uh, uh, the value that maximizes the plausibility function, we need to use more um, permutations so and so so we recommend uh, at least 10,000 especially for confidence interval because the point is to go away from the point estimate uh, of course so that takes long uh, a long time so we are exploring uh, options um, so we're exploring options of caching so each time you, you use get value to have um, just an hypothesis test. Um, we, we exp we're exploring currently the solution of caching the value. And then um, the, the idea would be that you, and, and the, the whole idea of using the R6 class was to say, okay, I can save it at some point with, with some values that are stored. And then later, if I have some computing power, I can, I can, I can reload it and add more and add more. And um, so that way, I mean, that, that's not accelerating things, but that's making things uh, we can do it in several steps. Um, so it's, it's yeah, and, and, it, and things get also worse when, uh, as I showed example here with one dimension, uh, one parameter, two parameters, but then uh, if we really want this to work, for example, for functional data, then we're gonna have um, a lot of evaluation on the function. So uh, the parameter space is very big. Um, so we are also exploring is uh, to evaluate on a coarse grid and then try to interpolate in some in some smart way. Hmm. Okay, um, I believe that answered the question that Alan uh, had. So uh, thank you once again, Dr. Emily, for answering that question. And uh, with that, I think we can wrap up this session. Have a nice conference, everyone. And I'll see you again in uh, future uh, sessions as well. Thank you. See you. Bye.